I'm going to continue this uh, journey and take you to the other side of the cardiac care to more chronic uh, heart failure. Okay. Um, and, and, and go through the guidelines that has been established and some of the new one, one that has, that's uh, just been uh, published to take you through how we treat um, heart failure both outpatient and, and in some instances inpatient. So this is a new expanded definition of heart failure. Um, heart failure is defined as complex clinical syndrome that results from L from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or reduction of blood. And you can see that the classification is now divided into four separate uh, categories from heart failure with reduced ejection fraction of less than equal to 40%, those with HFPEF or, or preserved ejection fraction, and, and uh, further defining the um, um, HFPEF borderline, those with 41 to 49%, and these are the individual who has been there and, and, and despite all the medical therapy sort of lived there, and versus those who have improved those who had ejection fraction of 20%, but now have uh, greater than 40%. And so those are called HFPEF improved. And the idea is it is thought that this uh, uh, the last category of patients actually has a, has a different uh, trajectory and outcome and, and, and to um, identify them so we can learn more about them. But that is the, the linguistics that you will see in the literature. To go through the pathophysiology of heart failure will take a lecture in itself, but these uh, hit the highlights. It happens with any kind of myocardial injury, myocardial infarction, hypertension, um, and what have you, and anything that reduces the left ventricular performance and decreases the cardiac output. And this sets in the motion of the neurohormonal responses, and of course, this is where we intervene, where we attenuate or we block some of these responses so that we can um, avoid or reduce the, the vasoconstriction and the water retention and all the other harmful um, effects that we see from this constant neurohormonal responses. The staging of the ACCHA um, um, heart failure staging, this has been published now for over a decade, and as, as you can see, um, stage A are those with high-risk features, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, just to name a few, and, and these patients really, um, this is the prime time where so much good can be done by identifying and helping the patients to, to uh, reduce their risk. And then stage B is those who have developed structural heart disease, but they have no symptoms. And this could be LVH, this could be some sort of a valvular disease, and even a mild LV dysfunction, but again, they are totally asymptomatic. Stage C is usually when they come to, uh, these patients come to a uh, physician's attention, where they begin to get symptoms along with the structural heart disease. And of course, us in our team, uh, a majority of our patients, we see them as stage D. And this is where they have refractory symptoms, multiple hospitalizations, and where we are mandated due to the uh, severity of their illness to go to the, uh, the next level, which is looking for any kind of a device or organ transplantation so that we can help them prolong their life and their quality of life. But you could see the one-year mortality listed there at the left from low as 2 to 3 percent a year at, the, at stage A to high as greater than 50 percent at stage D. And it is true that end-stage heart failure kills as much or even greater rate, rate than any kind of cancer. And we see this every day in our cohort and actually in some um, individuals who are not that old and actually as I advance on years, I don't think you know, 40, 50, 60s are not that, uh, are that old, but you know, we, we deal with uh, death uh, and mortality in these young individuals all the time. Now this is to, uh, to um, uh, differentiate from neurocardial session class. You use this all the time from function class one, two, three, and four. And to just highlight the fact that um, the two are, are meant to be used in concert. One does not complement the other. And the stages progress in one direction, of course, while the functional class can go back and forth depending on the treatment and depending on the compliance and their state of uh, disease overall. Now the stage A, to go through them, uh, these are the high-risk patients without any structural heart disease and no symptoms. And you can see that uh, this is where it is really strongly um, advocated for any kind of uh, risk factors, hypertension, lipid disorders, any kind of habits that can be modified to reduce their risk as they, as they live on. It's, it's very, very highly uh, recommended. Stage B, uh, this is where you have identified any kind of high blood pressure, any kind of uh, lipid disorder, to use those ACE inhibitors and the beta blockers and the statins because this is where you could do the most good. There, yes, there is some structural heart disease, but these therapies really do work well, and, and they, um, they can really help your patients to uh, live better lives to mitigate from any further uh, uh, cardiac harm. 
Now, just to uh, get some of the major treatments that we use in heart failure, you're all familiar with the solved uh, and, and uh, prevention and the treatment trials. You know, I remember when solved treatment uh, trial first came out back in 1991, and I have to date myself. I remember the excitement and um, the, the, just the amazement of, of my whole uh, 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 medicine team because up to that point, we only had diuretics and digitalis, and there really wasn't anything that we can do to modify or, or decrease the mortality that we saw all the time in heart failure. So this was big, to have a 16% decrease in all-cause all mortality from a medical therapy. I mean, this was a huge news. And of course, solve prevention showed us that even in asymptomatic individuals, if they have reduced LV function, that this should be used. And then there were a lot of studies to show that, you know, should we push it to the limit on, and dosing, you know, how, how much is too much. This has gone through the years in the past few decades, but low dose is beneficial, some is better than none, and whatever your patient can tolerate, really get it on board uh, and, and monitoring them very carefully. So this is the stage C ACE inhibitors and ARB uh, recommendation. And as you can see, the, the A um, uh, recommendation comes from, you know, use them uh, to avoid using uh, ACE and ARB in face of spironolactone because you can uh, run into hyperkalemia and, and uh, uh, kidney injury, so that you should avoid. But otherwise, uh, please do make sure that judiciously um, ACE inhibitors come first. If somebody's ACE intolerant, then you, can, you go to the ARB. Beta blockers has been the key turning stone in our heart failure, in a fighting with heart failure. And again, I remember the days when there were such uh, amazing um, literature of arguments and debates. Why would you give this patient with EF of 20% that further reduces cardiac output? I mean, are you out of your mind? I mean, I know right now this sounds like, you know, uh, did you really have that discussion? The answer is yes. I mean, we really had really uh, robust uh, discussion um, uh, because the, uh, at the time, it was all hemodynamically driven. We were after increasing cardiac output, and this is not the drug to do that. But long term, as we now know, um, beta blockers are amazing therapy, and probably the one that we push the most. And this is something that uh, we have known that saves lives. It's also um, uh, good for those with arrhythmia. Um, and you can see all the, all the trials that has been done, and, uh, and over um, uh, five, 6,000, I mean, many thousand, if you put them a cumulative um, um, number. But it has shown time and time again how effective it is. So it is uh, recommended uh, as, as a grade A, and you can see you can use one of the three beta blockers, bisoprolol, curvetolol, and sustained release of metoprolol. And, and I, again, emphasize the sustained release, which is topro XL, not the tartrate, but the succinate. And, and this is a, a mistake that we still see commonly happening, not the twice a day uh, beta blocker, but the once a day, and that's, that's really important. Um, and this is uh, uh, recommended to uh, all patients. And again, the matter of dosing comes up, and you know this is even more important in beta blockers as it is in ACE inhibitors, that a little is better than none. Even if you, you can start somebody on 3.1 to 5 curvetolol and send them home, studies have shown that it's really effective and beneficial in helping them uh, to uh, preserve their cardiac function and give them a chance to, you know, uh, for the cardiac recovery. There are some differences between the two beta blockers uh, from the dosing, curvetol or twice a day, metoprolol or succinate once a day. Um, there's a more of a antihypertensive or hypotension uh, producing effect with curvetol. So if you're somebody with high blood pressure and reduced ejection fraction, curvetol is your drug. If you have somebody with very soft blood pressure, you probably want to go with metoprolol. There are some other uh, specific population with those, those with diabetic. Um, uh, you, it has less insulin resistance, and, and for those with nuanced diabetes, and for metoprolol with COPD, it's more selective and less less potential for bronchospasm. So that might be a better drug for that uh, class. Um, Rouse. Uh, 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 demonstrated to us one of the oldest, uh, one of the older drugs, uh, spironolactone, how it can really help to uh, 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 preserve and actually has beneficial in reducing overall morbidity, mortality, and heart failure. Over 1,600 patients, functional class three, and 30% of functional class four. Actually, this had really one of the sickest cohort, uh, in, you know, in the modern era of, uh, of any large clinical trials. Only 10% of beta blockers, mind you. This was still, this is an old study, and at that time, beta blockers were not pushed as heavily. Um, you can see the exclusion with watching the creatinine and potassium, and they started at 25 milligrams a day. Um, they got labs at one week and four weeks and and you know and 
and I still use this practice, especially among the elderly and with those, those with diabetes or, and any kind of CKD, I really do make sure that they go for labs at, at one week and one month. Um, there was a, 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 a series of hyperkalemia and, and, and renal failure when spirulactone was first used with Raoul. So I think this is a, a lesson that we can all take back. And so this is, uh, again, uh, recommended um, for those with functional class two to four. Um, again, watching the creatinine um, and, and monitoring them very vigilantly. But most patients, and, and we, we even start them at 12.5, half a tablet a day, and make sure that you follow the labs. But they tolerate this very well. Um, if they have any kind of a, a, a CKD uh, stage two or beyond, again, um, on an elderly population, you, you need to watch them very closely. So what about the hydrolysis and isodil? Um, the AHEF trial demonstrated that on top of, not replacing, but on top of the ACE and ARP, beta blockers, and, and spironolactone, utilizing um, a, uh, hydrolysis and isodil combination on the Afri African-American cohort has significantly improved outcome. Now, having said this, it is not the easiest thing to take three times a day. Um, Bidil, you know, is, is at the cost, there's a cost prohibitive, prohibitive um, uh, um, aspect. So this is uh, often utilized, uh, those with CKD, where we are limited in how far we can push or use the ACE and ARB at all. So there is some real world versus what is recommended in guidelines. But if you do have a patient, African-American individual, hypertension, LV has remodeled, EF is slow, please remember this and give them the benefit of adding the, uh, the hydrolysis and isodil combination. And you can see the, um, uh, the recommendation here, as uh, well as the digoxin. Um, it has a grade B um, uh, recommendation. It is, has been shown to be beneficial, but again, you have to be uh, very judicious in monitoring those with elderly, any kind of CKD, especially in women, because they can be prone to digitoxicity. And, and they do mention the renal insufficiency being one of the re uh, main reasons why we, why we use uh, hydrolyzine. Anticoagulation does come with a grade A recommendation. Uh, those with permanent or persistent paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which, ha which is an additional risk factor for cardioembolic stroke. But uh, if they don't have any defined uh, risk factor uh, that you need anticoagulation, having heart failure itself is not an indication to put them in a systemic anticoagulation, so it is not recommended. The drugs that are not recommended for heart failure include, um, uh, again, utilizing the ACE, ARB, and aldosterone antagonists together, and uh, hormonal therapies beyond what you need to correct deficiencies, not recommended, and calcium channel blockers, especially verapamil, those that can decrease uh, cardiac output, uh, and are not recommended, those with um, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So if you put it all together in the past uh, you know, two decades or so, we have made a significant inroads in improving outcome in the heart failure population, in, initially with ACE inhibitors, adding beta blockers, and adding aldosterone uh, antagonists on top of that with, uh, with a significant uh, improvement in survival. And we were still there for actually quite about a decade or so, and, and now uh, we now have addition of two new drugs that has been added to the guidelines, and it's really exciting time for that. And, and this was a joint recommendation between the, uh, the ACCHA and the ESC that came out last year. And one, of course, is uh, covering um, Entresto, and, and, and um, oh, we have music. Okay. <laughs> And and uh, they uh, and of course uh, you all know how this works. Um, the endogenous uh, vasoactive peptides. These are the ones that we're trying to increase uh, in a patient heart failure population, and it decreases neurohormone activation, decreasing the vascular tone, fibrosis, and sodium retention. And of course, uh, naprolysin is one that degrades them. So if you can inhibit them, you can prolong um, their course of action. And this was uh, studied in the uh, landmark uh, clinical trial paradigm heart failure. And you can see the entry criteria there from uh, functional class two to four heart failure. EF uh, was initially less than 40 percent, but um, uh, in the later 35 percent, you could see the elevated BMP. And any use of ACE or ARB, but but uh, but able to tolerate a dose equivalent of uh, at least enalapril 10 milligrams a day. I'm sorry, this is a little strange, um, but um, don't ask me to sing. You would not like that at all. Trust me. Um, and the guideline recommended use of beta blockers and, and, and the aldosterone antagonist. 
And you can see the blood pressure also um, had a limit uh, uh, criteria there as, as well, our uh, entry criteria, because uh, this uh, agent can cause hypotension with systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 95, uh, GFR of greater than or equal to 30, and serum potassium that was less than or equal to 5.4. Oops. And you can see the, um, the cardiovascular uh, overall morbidity and mortality decrease, a very significant um, improvement in, in overall um, um, outcome. And the number need to treat uh, in order to see the benefit was 21. You know, so this was a huge um, uh, finding. And, and this is on top of all the therapies that we, uh, that we have that you know, uh, we know improve outcome. So the fact that um, um, having this therapy on top of that uh, added additional incremental value was, was an improvement, incredible finding. So this is a um, uh, now class one indication in patients with chronic symptomatic heart failure with functional class two to three who tolerate an ACE or ARB replaced by an RNA is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality. Um, it, you do need about 36 hours of washout time if you're going to take somebody from an ACE, ACE inhibitor to an RNA. If somebody's in an, in an ARB, you could just replace one to the other. And of course, they should never be used with anybody with history of angioedema. Um, most frequent adverse events really is hypotension. And uh, so they do come in three doses. It is recommended that you use uh, on, a, on a lower dose first and monitor them carefully. But peop, you know, people do uh, tolerate this well and actually we have seen a significant improvement in clinical uh, class and also LB function and, and using, um, using this class of drugs. So one more and then I'll come to an end. So Ivarudine, um, this is uh, to control the heart rate and this acts by reducing the uh, heart rate via a specific inhibition of the funny channel. This is present in the sinoatrial node and the way this works, the mechanism is different from that of beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and uh, they do not alter the ventricular repolarization, myocardial contractility or the blood pressure. And as you know, the SHIFT trial uh, that was published uh, demonstrated that there was, a, there was a meaningful decrease in the composite endpoint uh, of cardiovascular death and hospital admission. But it, it is noteworthy to, to mention that it's, it's mainly driven by hospitalization and not mortality. And uh, so it received a, a grade 2A recommendation uh, for management of those with chronic heart failure. And I think the big take home point here is that you really must push the beta blocker first. So uh, make sure that the beta blocker is as is, is, is much as the patient can tolerate it before you, you think about ivabrodine. And I think that brings me to end. And thank you and good luck.